So today we need to talk about terms concerning ethics. As you can see, there's quite a bit of material to cover, so I'm going to go to a fairly good clip here, because I don't want to make this video too long. Alright, some general things about epics that you need to keep in mind as you approach the Odyssey. The genre of the epic is actually the most ancient genre we have. Again, just like with plays, we're going back to ancient Greece and looking at, specifically for this class, the Odyssey, although we also have the Iliad. Um, we're talking about something that is 2,700 years old now. That's pretty old. So, really ancient genre. The whole purpose of the uh, epic was to have an elevated style. Keep in mind this is a really long poem. If you've never read the Odyssey before, then you don't know, but it's about this thick. So, the historical person of Homer you know, there's an argument about whether he really existed specifically as a man named Homer. Whatever, don't care. But he sang this thing. You know, it was a song. We have it as a poem now. But this elevated style is more the result of the fact he was singing this very important song. He was a bard. And he would go from town to town, place to place, and perform this poem. And of course it took many, many nights. So this would take a lot of talent and a lot of resilience to actually pull off. So, the epic does have an elevated style, it has a focus on noble characters, in two senses. One, in theory they should behave fairly nobly, the other being that they should be noble and courageous, which I'll get to in a moment. The focus of the epic is also on the adventures of a central hero, in this case obviously Odysseus. And they often found, uh, trace the founding of a nation or a people. Not always, though, obviously. In the case of the Odyssey, that's not what we have. What we have is a story of a man trying to return home from war. So the Iliad is part one. It is the Trojan War. Odysseus is one of the generals fighting in the war. And he is also the king of Ithaca. Because in ancient Greece, you had city-states, not one unified nation. So the kings of these various city-states got together and served as generals in the Trojan War. So it is not going to trace the founding of a people in this particular case. But some others do. Another classic example would actually be Milton's Paradise Lost. He literally retells the story of the Garden of Eden. So that's a tracing the founding of a people there. All right. Elements and conventions of epics. Your hero must be a very important person of some kind. Again, obviously, Odysseus is quite important. He is a king, and he is also a general serving in the Trojan War, who then spends all of the Odyssey going on this huge journey to get back home to his city kingdom of Ithaca, which is a little island. The hero generally has a tragic flaw, though. They get some in trouble. In Odysseus' case, most assuredly he does, and that's something that I want you to watch for while you're reading. What is his tragic flaw? I chose Book 9 for a couple of reasons, but one reason is because it reveals Odysseus' tragic flaw. This is where he gets himself in trouble. If he had just not given in to his tragic flaw, he could have sailed straight home, basically. He could have been home in a matter of weeks. Instead, it took him ten years to get home, and it's his fault. All right, the setting is vast. In the Odyssey, we have the entire, like, Greek world, the Mediterranean Sea, you know. It's just a part of the world that they knew of. But they still had him covering a great deal of space. But the other reason why the setting is vast is because it often, epics often involve going down into the underworld. There's this passage that you have to take through the underworld to go through some kind of test or gain some kind of knowledge before you come back to the living world and can finish your quest, whatever that happens to be. So, this is why you often run into supernatural forces. But, first, actions of the hero are courageous. Odysseus is certainly courageous, but that's not the only thing he has going for him. Odysseus is an unusual character for his time period because he actually has something more than bravery on his side. He's smart. All of the previous heroes are really brave, but not really that bright. They're basically all brawn with no brains. 
So Odysseus breaks this mold and becomes brawn and brains. Still, he's got the brawn and he's got the courage. Supernatural forces, epics can involve demons, gods, angels, um, any number of fantastic monsters, all sorts of different supernatural forces. You run into a lot of the Greek gods during the course of the Odyssey. In the case of Milton's Paradise Lost, you have God, Satan, and angels. So, supernatural forces. The epithets were the tags. The tags were things that were put on people's name, because again, you're singing something this long. The person, the bard, who is performing the story wants to make sure that you can keep track of who all these characters are. So he added tags to their names. In the case of Odysseus, Odysseus the man of many wiles. That's his tag. That's helping you remember who he is. You say, swift-footed Achilles. That one, that's a, a tag for him. Athena gets the crappiest tag, honestly. She gets gray-eyed Athena. Well, the fact that she has gray eyes is really kind of meaningless. A more appropriate tag would have been Wise Athena, because her main characteristic was actually wisdom. But for some reason, he doesn't give her that tag. Seems kind of like a jerk thing to do, right? Number one thing we want to know about Odysseus? Well, he's a man of many wiles. He's very smart. He's very wily. He can pull off a lot of stunts. So that's his tag. Epics always started with the invocation to the muse. The muses were Greek goddesses of arts and poetry and music. So in order to begin a singing this huge long song, the bard would invoke the muse to want to, you know, pick a muse, muse of song, muse of poetry, whatever, invoke the muse. But, um, in the case of the Odyssey, Homer doesn't actually name the muse, he just says muse, and says a prayer. So the invocation is literally a prayer. Help me sing this song, help me tell the story well of the man Odysseus and his many trials as he tried to get back to his home in Ithaca. I'm paraphrasing. That's basically what it says. This is so important that even though Milton is writing about Christian concepts, he still invokes the muse, even though he doesn't believe in the muses as real goddesses. Epics open in media ray. Um, I've heard a couple different pronunciations of this, by the way. It is a Latin term that means in the middle of the action. So they open in the middle of the action. You can see the words in and middle kind of there. You can kind of almost recognize it. So, in the case of the Odyssey, you're opening after Odysseus has already been gone from home for 20 years. So you actually begin with his son, not with him. His son is 20 years old. So his wife was pregnant when Odysseus left, and his son was born after he set sail to go fight in the Trojan War for 10 years. Yes, this war took 10 years. And then it takes Odysseus another 10 years to take home. So Odysseus' son is fed up with not having a father, and the fact that all the suitors who were trying to date his mom so they can become king and take the castle and the lands, you know, he's sick to death of these guys. They're jerks, they're living in their house for free, they have eaten them out of house and home. The kingdom is bankrupt. You know, it's a terrible situation. So he's like, I'm sick of this. I want my father. I want to have a father at all. I'm going to find my father. And Athena is the goddess who answers and says, I'm going to help you. He doesn't know he's being helped by Athena. But that is what happens. So we are starting very much in the middle of the action. When we first meet Odysseus, we don't meet him until book five. And he's on a piece of driftwood in the ocean. He has nothing left. He sets sail to... Troy with 12 ships, he sets sail going back to Ithaca with those 12 ships and 144 men. That's pretty good. That's actually a full complement. These aren't huge ships. So that's what he had and all he has left by the time we meet him, finally in book five, is a plank of wood. So he is in bad, bad shape. So much of the Odyssey is actually Odysseus telling the story of what has happened to him. And that is why I'm having you start with book nine. Book nine is when he starts telling the story. So you are actually beginning at the place where he says, my name is Odysseus. He's saying this to the king and queen of the Phaeacians. This is the island he washes up onto the shore of on his little piece of driftwood. 
So he walks in, thanks to Greek hospitality, they don't even ask his name, they just feed him, they put on, you know, get their bard to sing, they have discus throw and archery games and things like that, and uh, he starts crying when he's listening to the bard because the bard is telling the story of the Trojan War. In other words, the bard is seeing the Iliad. He starts crying because this is a story about how all of his friends died in battle. They ask him what's wrong, and at the beginning of Book 9, he's like, Okay, I'll tell you. My name is Odysseus, I am the king of Ithaca, and this is the story of how I tried to sail home from uh, Troy to Ithaca and everything that went wrong. So he t begins on that fateful day ten years ago when he set sail from Troy, and then for the rest of Book 9, you're in the past. You're a decade in the past as he tells the story to the king and queen. This, actually, I'm going to jump over epic similes for a moment, brings us to the concept of epics often having formal speeches. All of books 9, 10, 11, and 12 are one big long speech that Odysseus makes to the king and queen, telling him the story of everything, them the story of everything that has happened in the entire last 10 years. So this huge story. Then in book 13 they start reacting to the story, they give him a ship, they give him riches, they give him men to help him sail home, and at this point he finally does, after all this time, make it to Ithaca. And then the rest of the epic is dealing with, he finds the suitors, he has to get rid of the suitors, meets his son, comes back to the point of, finally gets to his wife, Penelope, who's been waiting all this time, and convinced he's still alive, even though she has no proof whatsoever, but she's determined to hang on. So there you have it. Uh, the epic similes, yeah, let me not forget that. Obviously, elevated style of an epic is going to get you something very epic indeed. And one of those things, other than a huge epic adventure, is the epic simile. So the general assembly would be, uh, simile would be, um, when you smile, your face lights up like the sun or whatever. Okay, fine, whatever. It's like this long. The epic simile pages sometimes. I mean, they could get really involved. At the very least, you're going to get the equivalent of a paragraph. You are reading the prose form instead of the poetry form. I thought it might be a little easier on you to read a prose form. We have translations that are in both styles. Easily you can find either version. Um, but yeah, even in the poetry version, it could at least be this long and sometimes much longer still. It just depended on that particular bard or later in Milton's case, writer, because uh, Milton did not sing Paradise Lost. So, they are known for that as well. Alright, so I have a couple of themes that I want you to focus on while you are reading. These are some themes that go throughout the entire Odyssey. And one of the nice things about Book 9 is, they all show up. One is the issue of hospitality. In other words, you have to be a good host, and you also have to be a good guest. At this point, again, Greek is not a full, uh, Greece is not a fully formed nation. You have a bunch of city-states, so when people traveled, again, no modern hotels or anything. They had to stop at people's homes for the night. So there was this huge rule, this law of hospitality, that Zeus supposedly enforced, where you had to be a good host to whoever showed up at your door and said, we need lodging for the night, and whoever those people were had to be a good guest to you. If you violated that law, supposedly Zeus would punish you. So as you were reading Book 9, keep track of do we have good or bad hosts and Odysseus and his men? Are they being good or bad guests? Alright, another thing. Disguises. Disguises are used all throughout the Odyssey. In this particular case, we definitely have, in Book 9, some disguises going on. This is a main way that characters are getting around and pulling off their tricks and sometimes literally saving their own lives. So watch for that. Wily Odysseus is definitely a man who is good at trickery and deceit. He uses it many times throughout the epic, and Book 9 is also a good case 
of the use of trickery. So watch for that. Final thing I want you to watch for is the relationship between men and deities. Specifically men in this case. You don't really get many female characters in the Odyssey and then when you do they don't really have much of a part. So specifically men and deities because we have very active gods and goddesses both in this case. So what is the relationship here? You know, how are the gods or goddesses in some cases acting, reacting, and interacting with the men who are calling on them or violating whatever that god or goddess is protecting? In the case of Zeus, as I said, hospitality, protecting both hosts and guests. So these are the four things I want you to watch for as you are reading and then in your discussion forum or if we are still in class, huh? In class, this is what I want you to be able to discuss, okay?